of a place. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. I'm going to be talking a lot about the church, but, but I'm speaking of the building today, not, not the church as the ecclesia. The ecclesia is the called out ones. That's you and I. We Christians, we make up the church, whether we're in a tent or in a garden uh, or, or wherever we are, we are the church. But the building, the church building is where we gather. In the Old Testament, they called it the temple. And so, uh, but today I want to talk about the church, a place of power. And I, first of all, an understanding of place is fundamental to the concept of livability, including transportation and uh, related aspects of livability. People live in places. We move within and between places. Um, And and we depend on the movement of goods and uh, services to and from places. The individual characteristics of places are vital in determining the quality of our life. So a place can be important because it provides you kind of an identity. Let me give you an example. If someone mentions the place of the Harbor Worship Center, I'll bet you more than likely my face might pop to your mind or my name might pop to your mind. Or vice versa, if someone mentions my name, you would quickly associate me with this place called the Harbor. I'll give you another example. Uh, you might have met your favorite singer at a concert at a certain place. It could have been a civic center somewhere or, you know, the Omni or wherever, but maybe it was a ball game. Perhaps you were uh, at the Brave Stadium years ago and you met Greg Maddox, you know, a tremendous pitch, a pitcher for the Braves. And um, so all of a sudden, every time you pass by, that, that field, you, your, your mind, you go back to that time. See, places are important because of the experience, both positive and negative, that happened in that place. Let me give you another example. Right here in this altar, you know, just a few months ago, we had a miracle service, and we have Two babies on the way where doctors just said it was impossible, but God said it is possible. We got someone that has a liver because man said they can't have one, but God said they could get one. And we have notable miracles that happened as we prayed in this place. So when I look at the church building, so to speak, and I think of the the church, and I think of Uh, its history, and I survey that history, I find three descriptions, and I'd like to share that with you, and it's what God just gave me in study this week. Three descriptions of this place we call church. Number one is the church is a prominent place. It's prominent because it is where God has decided to meet with his people corporately. Not that you can't meet at home or in your garden or prayer closet or or wherever else, because you surely can. However, the church was built for corporate gathering where we come together with an intention to praise the name of God. We come with an intention to worship and be demonstrative in our praise. And we come to to give. And we come to serve. And we come to learn. And we come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is why the church is a prominent place. You know, it's in such a prominent place that we choose to dedicate our children to the Lord when they're born we, say, we, we think so much about this place, and it's where we meet with God, and it's where we hear from the man of God, and it's where we are prayed over. It's where we're, uh, we, we bring our babies and offer them back to God. It's where we uh, ordain men and women for ministry and set them forth. Uh, it's where we uh, come to say our marriage vows in this sacred place, this prominent place. Many have... Uh, spent their last uh, hours lying in repose right here. 
I'll tell you right now, I don't know what will happen to me in the days to come, but no matter what it is, I'll spend my last night right here in this altar before I leave this world. That'll be my last stopping place. It'll be in this prominent place. And then somebody will say whatever words it's going to be said, and, uh, and then I'll go on to whatever they'll do with me. But the church is a prominent place, and I, I want to take you to a mirror image of the church, but this goes back to the Old Testament, and it's when Solomon had built the temple, and it was so important to him, and he said in Second Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 1, Solomon prayed and said, Oh, Lord, you have said that you will live in a thick cloud of darkness. Verse 2, he said, Now I have built a glorious temple for you, a prominent place, if you will, a place where you can live forever. And then the king turned around to the entire community of Israel standing before him, and he gave his blessing and said, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has kept his promise and his, that he made to my father David. For he told my father, From the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have never chosen a city among the tribes of Israel as a place where a temple should be built to honor my name, nor have I chosen a king to lead my people Israel. But now I have chosen, what's this, a place. I've chosen Jerusalem as a place for my name to be honored. Let me remind you before I read further, he tells us in the Bible to pray for that place, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's part of God's mandate for you and I, that we would pray for that land, and we do that. He said he's chosen uh, uh, this place, and he says, my father David wanted to build this temple to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, you wanted to build the temple to honor my name, and your intention was good, but you're not going to be the one to do it. It'll be one of your sons that'll build the temple to honor me. And the Lord has now fulfilled the promise that he made, for I have become king in my father's place, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. I have built this temple, this prominent place back then to honor. Guess what? There he said, I have built this to honor the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark. That was the ark of the covenant that, that contained some of the manna that the children ate while they were on the journey. It contained the Decalogue, the Ten Words, that is the Ten Commandments. It contained Aaron's rod that budded, uh, even though it was dead. It contained all of that. And he said, I have brought the ark to this place. In verse 18, he continued as he prayed and said, but will God really live on the earth among people? He, he under, well, I don't really think he understood the vastness of God because I don't know that any finite mind can. But what he understood was he had built a marvelous place, a beautiful place. And he said, but really, who, who is the Lord that he would, is he really going to dwell among men and the highest of heavens cannot contain him. How much less this temple that I've built. In other words, when you look at this prominent place, this wonderful place, and I think about the queen of Sheba, when she went to see the temple, and she looked and surveyed all the beauty and the splendor of the temple, and she said, the half had not been told of, to me of the beauty of this place. I'm telling you right now, this place was magnificent, but he says, is God really going to live here? You see, heaven is God's throne. The earth is his footstool. In other words, he props his feet up on the earth. What could we build to contain him? So it's not that we can contain God. You can't, but... God's people come to this prominent place, and we come here with an intention to worship the Lord. We come here to bring the first fruits of our increase, our tithe and our offerings. We come here to pray and to be healed, and we come here to serve. So not only do we come here to serve, we come here to meet with God. We, we, this is the place where where we see him, where we meet with him. And Solomon wrote this in chapter 7 of the Chronicles when he said, when Solomon finished praying, 
fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings. And the, the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. See, we come to this prominent place, and it's here where the glory of God fills the temple. Some people have described it, man, that feeling, that sensation, there's something about it when I come to the house of God. Maybe it happens when I'm preaching. It might happen when we're singing. But there's just a feeling that you cannot describe, and you get it nowhere else. The Bible said the priest could not even minister uh, or the enter in the temple because the glory of the presence of God was so strong in that place. He said when all the people saw that Israel, uh, they saw fire coming down, the glorious presence of God filling the place, they fell down to the ground and they worshiped and they praised the Lord and said, He is good and His faithful love endures forever. So that is a prominent place. That's what the church is. It's a prominent place where we meet with God and we are never the same. The second, the second um, uh, thing I want you to understand is that, or the second description, if I may, is that not only is it a prominent place, it is a priceless place. I'm reminded of Isaiah the prophet. He had an encounter with God in Isaiah chapter 6. It was similar um, to this, if you will. In fact, I, I can read some of what he saw. The Bible says that Isaiah said, when, the, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He said he was high and lifted up. He was seated on his throne. His train filled the temple. And seraphims uh, flew and they cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. It was a priceless place. You see, I want you to know, you can never place a price tag on the experience that you have in this prominent place. I'll tell you right now, you, you show me a mom or a dad who sees their children come down to an altar and give their heart to the Lord and renounce a life of drug addiction or renounce a life of abuse and uh, all that kind of stuff. And you see them delivered and you see them set free. Maybe you, you talk to someone who had a notable miracle that happened at the altar. You could never, never put a price tag on that and what happened right there. It was in that place where Isaiah was, in the temple, when he came to grips with the glory of a holy God. It is there where he realized that he was a wretched man, that he was a sinful man. You see, it's in this prominent place. It is in this priceless place where we often come, and not only us, but we bring friends here. We invite them no matter what they look like, no matter where they're from, no matter what they live like, their addictions, uh, whatever they do, we just say, come to the house of God. Come as you are. And, and we just present the gospel to them, and we let the Lord do his work. And in, in this prominent place, in this priceless place, it is here where Isaiah come to grips with the glory of a holy God, and he realized he was wretched. He said it like this in chapter 6 and verse 6. Then one of the seraphims, the winged creatures, he, he, with a burning coal that he had taken with a pair of tongs from the altar, he come and he touched my lips and he said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. That reminds me of this priceless place that we're in right now. I'm telling you, when we get up from an altar and our sins have been removed and the weight of guilt and shame and depravity has been lifted off of our shoulder, we never, we can't put a price tag on the feeling that we feel, the liberty that we have when we walk out of this place. That's the way Isaiah felt. He said, but when I noticed the Lord, he was high, he was exalted, he was lifted up, and his train, when, when I say a train, I'm speaking of like the train of a bride's uh, dress. The longer the train, I remember Princess Diana years ago in, when, when she was married, or when, when she got married, the train just went forever and ever. 
Now, in the Orient, you've got to understand, the longer the train, the more majestic the person that's wearing it. And Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, and his train just continued to fill the temple. Just continued to fill the temple and smoke arose and the, the columns of the temple shook. And he said, I saw the Lord. And when we truly see the Lord, where was he at? He was in the temple. Not that you can't see him down by the river. Yes, you can. Not that you can't see him in a cottage or beside your bed. But Isaiah said, I saw the Lord seated on his throne. He said, I went to the temple and I saw him. And when he saw all of the majesty of the Lord, and he saw the seraphs as they flew and they cried, and one took a, a, a coal from off the altar and touched his lips, and he said, your iniquities have been taken away. And then he heard a question. He was in this prominent place. He was in this priceless pay, place. And it was here when he heard a call that said, who will go for us. And to whom shall we send? And he said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I want to tell you something. It's in a prominent place like the church. In a priceless place like the church where God saved me. Where God called me into the ministry. And... Uh, I can't put a price tag on that. I'm telling you. There, listen, there is power when people come together in a particular place for a particular purpose. And I'm telling you that expectation and those intentions when we gather. Listen, I know COVID has had us so spread out. And we're here and there and everywhere. And we've had good viewership online. And I thank God for it. But, and, and, but listen, that will never, ever take the place of gathering together in the same place, in one mind and in one accord, with one intention to lift our voices and sing praises to the Lord. There's something majestic about getting together as the people of God in a certain place and calling on God. So, matter of fact, Jesus said, it brings me to my third description. Not only is the church a, a prominent place, not only is it a priceless place, but it is a powerful place, number three. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So, I, I think about Jesus uh, uh, after he had come back from the dead. He was raised from the dead, resurrected. And he said to his disciples, he said, and he told 500 brethren this, I want you to go to Jerusalem or stay in Jerusalem. And I want you to stay here in a particular place. I don't want you to evangelize. I don't want you to go here and there and everywhere. I want you to stay here in this place until you are endued with power from on high. He had promised that if I go away, I'll send the Comforter. That is the Holy Ghost. He said, if I go away, I'll send him. He said, I want you to stay here until you receive what I'm telling you is coming. And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in verse 1, he said, on the day of Pentecost, Penta means 50, 50 days after the Passover, on the day of Pentecost, all of these believers, now, now I want you to get something. I, I want to put a little footnote in here. Jesus told 500 people to stay in Jerusalem in this place and wait for the promise of the Father. But only 120 showed up that day. And, and so Jesus had some church attendance issues too, I guess. So, but on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in that one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. It filled the house where they were sitting. Then the, uh, what, 
what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each, of, each one of them, and everyone was present and filled with the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Now, here's what I want you to know. In that place, there were, uh, there, there, there were people from all over the known world, and God designed it that way because every male Jew 20 years old and up by law had to attend the Feast of Pentecost. But, but here it is. There were Medes and Elamites and people from Phrygia and Pamphylia and Cappadocia and Asia and uh, uh, all of these places around the known world. They were there in this one place, this powerful place gathered as the people of God. I'm telling you, friend, there's something special about gathering together with expectation and faith in the house of God. Now, there's another couple of occasions I want to mention to you uh, I'll talk about before I bring this thing in for a landing, and that is there was a fellow in the Old Testament by the name of Jacob. You remember, and there was Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. So Jacob's the grandson of Abraham. And um, he had uh, swindled his brother out of his birthright, and he was on his way uh, now to his uncle Laban's house. And he's headed there, and he, he built him, uh, or he put a stone uh, for his head to lay on, and he had a dream that night. And in that dream, he saw the angels of God descending upon him and ascending back, back and forth, traversing between heaven and earth. He woke up and said, God was in this house. And he named the place Bethel because Bethel means the house of God. Oh, what a prominent place, the house of God. Oh, what a priceless place place, the house of God. Oh, what a powerful place. He said, God was here and I didn't even realize it. Now, let me fast forward 20 years, 20 years. He has served now his uncle Laban. He's married Rachel and Leah. He also has Bilhah and Zilpah. He's got all of his kids now. 20 years has passed by and he's made his uncle mad and he's headed back. Uh, I believe it's to Peyton Aram. He's headed back, and then he's on his way, and his uncle is chasing after him because he didn't even say goodbye. He just took his girls and his grandbabies, and he left. So Uncle Laban is on his tail. He's, he's, he's coming after him, and then he has someone tell him that your brother Esau is in front of you, and he's closing the distance, and he's bringing 400 men with him. This scared Jacob to death because the last thing he heard from Esau's mouth 20 years ago was because of you stealing my birthright, when daddy dies, I'll kill you. So that night, with Uncle Laban coming after him and brother Esau coming toward him, he turned aside and went across the river. And the Bible says that he wrestled with the angel of God all night long. He prayed all night long. He got a hold of God and he wrestled with an angel. And finally that angel says to him, let me go for the day is breaking and I've got to go. And Jacob said, I'll not let you go. Watch this. From this place, I'm not letting you go. Until you bless me. I wish some of you would get bold with God like that and come to the church and hold on to the altar and say, I ain't leaving here. I'm not getting back up, God, till you show up in my life, until you fix this brokenness in me. And that night, Jacob refused to let go. And the angel looked at him and said, tell me your name. And I imagine Jacob thought I was hoping you would not ask me because Jacob's name literally means liar, supplanter, deceiver, heel grabber. That's what he was. He had, he had struck up raw deals and he had cheated and, and, and done all kinds of things all his life. And now it's coming home to roost. He has to admit to God. Oh, by the way, that, that's what you have to do. If you want something different in your life, first of all, you've got to admit where you are. 
The angel is basically saying, tell me your name. Tell me what you are. So listen, while you're in this prominent place, in this priceless place, in this powerful place called the church, that's where you got to come face to face with who you are. That's why the message just seems to, to scare you to death when I'm preaching sometime and you say, man, who told him all of this about me? It ain't nobody told me anything. The Holy Spirit knows where you live and knows what you do. And so the Bible says, after he told the angel that, the angel says, I'm going to bless you. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but your name shall be called Israel. That's why we call them the 12 tribes of Israel, because Jacob's sons uh, represent the tribes of Israel. And the angel said, now here, you got to understand, this is so neat. You're not no longer known by what you used to be. Liar, deceiver, supplanter, heel grabber, all that that Jacob meant. He said, now your name is Israel. I, I think about an old song we used to sing. And the old red back hymn said, there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. So listen, he, he named that place something, and I think it's important. You remember 20 years ago, he had a special place where he slept. And when he saw the angels traversing between heaven and earth, and he said, this is the house of God. And he was here, and I didn't know it. Well, today, 20 years later, when he prayed all night, and he wrestled with the angel, and finally the angel touched him and his hip was out of joint the rest of his life. He renamed him Israel and he called the name of the place Penuel. You know what it means? It means the face of God. He says, this is where I turned to God. Oh, yes, that prominent place, that special place. Man, I remember where it was. For me, the first assembly of God in Phoenix City, Alabama in 1983. I remember hearing Charlie Fowler preach the message, A Journey Through Hell. I remember when the lights came on, Kelly and I both ran to an altar. And it is in that place where I answered the call of God, not only on my life, but the call of God to ministry, even though I run. That's where he called. You see, this harkens back to Isaiah's encounter. You see, at the end of the day, it's not so much the place uh, of the gathering, uh, or excuse me, not so much the place, but the gathering and the expectation and the faith of the people. That's what moves God. It has everything to do with what happened in that place. I'll guarantee you Jacob could tell everybody the rest of his life why he limped upon his thigh because he wrestled with an angel to the breaking of day. The angel changed his name and changed the course of history. I'll guarantee you. I can take you to the place where God saved me. There's something special, something very special about this place. And I want to close with this as I've come near the end. The Apostle Paul, for him, it was not in the church building, but it was, he was on the Damascus Road. You know, he was on his way somewhere to persecute Christians. And a great light shone around him, and he was knocked off of his horse or donkey, whatever he was on. And he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul. That was his name before it was changed to Paul. Why do you persecute me? And... It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And he said, who art thou, Lord? What will you have me to do? You see, and, and it was in that, I'll guarantee you the rest of Paul's life. You know why? Paul never got over getting saved. Everywhere he went, he told everybody about the Damascus Road experience. He told the soldiers about it. He told the centurion about it. He told the governor Felix about it. He told the most noble Festus about it. Everywhere he went, he recounted his story, constantly telling them what happened to him on the Damascus Road. For Moses, it was on a mountain. He was holding the tablets and God wrote the Ten Commandments in the stone. And, you know, but for all of them, whether it was Paul, whether it was Moses, for Moses, for all of them, 
Their lives were changed forevermore because of that encounter at that place. It's amazing. So what, what, what happens in a place causes you to remember that place forever. As I close this message, I want to take you to one more place. It's a very powerful, very, very powerful place. And the guy that went there's name was Abraham. He told his wife, Sarah, he said, Sarah, myself and the lad, Isaac, we're going to go over to yonder mountain and we're going to worship. And I and the lad will come back. Now, here's what I want you to understand. He said that in faith because God had already told him to take his young son to the top of Mount Moriah and kill him as a burnt sacrifice on an altar unto God. So he takes his young boy, 17, 18, 19 years old, and that boy has firewood. It's bound up. They have a knife. They have the donkey, and they're walking up this hill. And the young boy says to his father, he says, Dad, he said, I, I have the wood and I've got the knife. We've got the, we got the sac- you know, we've got all of that, but where's the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? Or the ra- what, what are we going to offer God? And Abraham said, Son, God is going to provide a sacrifice. He walked on up that, I mean, he walked all the way on up that hill that, to the mountain, the very top, and he built an altar. And he asked his son to come over and he has him sit down right here. And now to lay down, what are you doing, Dad? What are you doing? And he begins to bind his ankles and his knees and his waist, his shoulders, his hands. He's tied him down to this altar. I thought you said God was going to provide a ram. I thought you said God was going to give us a sacrifice. Why aren't you tying me up like this, Dad? And the Bible says that Abraham took the knife and he reared back with that knife and he's coming down to kill his only son. And just before the blade hit his son, an angel stopped and said, don't hurt the lad. Don't hurt him. Now I know that you trust me. And I want to ask you this. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that if he killed Isaac that day, he believed that if he killed him, that God would raise him from the dead. And so so Abraham went all the way to the top of Mount Moriah and he did what he did based on his faith and his trust in God. This was a prominent place for him. It became a priceless place for him and it was a powerful place for him. I want to ask you, have you reached your Moriah? Have you got to the place where you, like Abraham, will lay all of it on the altar and trust God with your everything. It's a serious question. I don't know what would be harder. I I mean, what could be harder than taking your only son? Now, God knows because he did it. But Abraham took his and tied him down and was willing to kill him and said, I know God will raise him up. I want you to understand something. When you get to the place, when you get to the place in your walk with God, wherever it is where you can say, God, I'm going to lay it all on the altar. This is my Moriah. This is the prominent place where my business is laid on the altar. My, my money's laid on the altar. My family's laid on the altar. My problems are laid on the altar. My addictions are laid on the altar. Everything I have is on the altar. My God, my God. What a place. 
What a place when you can lay it all there. I want to ask you now as I close. Can you lay it all down? The power of a place. And yes, I've been talking about church because church is so important to us. And I do understand that there are some that cannot because of the, the risk involved. And you, you cannot come next Sunday. And I, got, I got that. If that's you, I truly understand. But then there are others that you can and you can share it, and you can say, I'm coming, and I'm going to honor the grads, and we're going to pray for the babies and the kids. But in this powerful, powerful place, next week we're going to talk about the power of one. You don't want to miss it. But listen, if you're here right now, and you've reached your Mariah, you've reached that place where you say, Pastor, I, I want to be like Abraham and lay it all down. Here's what you do right where you're at, right there in your living room or beside your bed or wherever you are. If you're driving, please just pull over and just kneel before the Lord right where you are and say, God, I surrender all. I'm at this place. I, 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 I've reached this, this Moriah place in my life where I'm just going to lay it all on the altar like Abraham did. He put his everything on the altar. I want you to put your everything there. The rest of my life, God, all of my hopes and all of my dreams, my plans, everything, God, my possessions, everything I have, God, I heap it up on the altar and say, God, I don't control it. It's yours. My business, my life, my dream, everything. And I'm telling you, when you commit it all to God, when you get up from that altar, a weight will be lifted off your shoulders like you would not believe. And when you begin to put Him first in everything you do, your walk is going to be different. Your talk is going to be different. People are going to say, man, something's happened to him or her. I want to pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, for that person right now that's watched this message, and their heart has been touched and pricked right now. They can't seem to shake it. And they want to they do like Abraham. They want to just lift everything and lay it on that altar right now. Oh, God, help them as they turn it all over to you right now. Oh, God, as they lay that down and realizing that they can't handle it, they can't do it. Oh, God, may they just look up to you and say, Lord, I need your help. Please help me today, Lord. I can't run this business by myself, Lord. I can't handle these things that's, that, that's handling me right now. These people are driving me crazy. This marriage, uh, this job, the, all of this, these addictions, these habits, these hang-ups, whatever it is, turn it over to God. And if you'll do that, you let Him handle it. You let Him have it. What a difference He'll make in your life. So God, right now, as they turn it over to you, May they invite you to come into their heart. And your word says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you believe in Jesus Christ and that God raised him from the dead and you ask him to come into your heart right now, he will do just that. So why don't you just love on him right now? Why don't you just right where you are, just lift your hand and say, I love you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Thank you for being the Lord of my life. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to do something special for me. I want you to go to harborwc.com forward slash next steps. And I want you to tell me that you gave your heart to the Lord. I want you to uh, sign up for baptism. Uh, let us know you want to get baptized. You've accepted Jesus. If you're first, second, or third time guest with us, go to harborwc.com forward slash connections. And, and, and tell us that you're a first, second, or third time guest. We want to mail you a gift. We want to be in touch with you. We want to help you in, in, walk out this life of Christianity. We want to get you involved serving. We want to get you involved in a life group. We're not going to inundate you with, with mail and all that stuff, but we are going to love on you. We want to be here for you. Now, last but not least, this is vitally important as well. If you want to bless the Lord today with your giving if you want to bless him by bringing the tithe, the tenth, harborwc.com forward slash give. Or you can just take your, your phone. You can text to give. They've got the number there. I'm pretty sure it's on the screen. You can do that or use the Church Center app. Let me say, uh, 
I, I heard from our overseer this morning, and he, he said to me that 40 South Georgia congregations has broke their all-time tithe record during the midst of COVID season. And you, Harbor Friends, have done it twice. I commend you for your giving. Your giving is making a difference, not only in this church, but in this community and literally around the world. In fact, I was asked today about our church providing some meals for, for nurses this coming week. We're going to do that. We're honored to do that. And your giving makes things like that happen. It makes it so easy for us to say, yes, we want to be a blessing. And, and that's why God has blessed us so much. He knows that we're just a conduit. We don't hoard things up. We allow it to flow through us. And so thank you so much for your giving. It makes a tremendous difference. My prayer is that God will go before you and bless you. Hey, don't forget, share this video. Don't forget that next Sunday, August the 2nd, is our first Sunday back here in this sanctuary. And we're going to pray for our children that will be returning to school the next day. And we're going to honor our high school graduates and our college graduates on that day. Please, graduates, go to harborwc.com and there's a link for you to sign up to, to be honored next Sunday as a graduate. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day.